I want to once again welcome you to the Writer's Circle. <coughs> this is our third session. As uh, you know, um, uh, Will Akers and I um, had this idea that uh, the public library would be the perfect place to create uh, a uh, monthly gathering of uh, people who are interested in good writing, and the concept was to bring two authors um, and to uh, have each of them read the work of the other. And um, I think for those of you who've been here before, uh, it's been fascinating. I think Will's questions have been phenomenal, but I think he would agree with me that some of the most interesting questions we got came from you. And so you're going to have another shot at these two distinguished <coughs> authors today. Um, um, and we're lucky that, um, that we have uh, Adam Ross and John Edgerton um, with us. Both of them uh, come to Nashville from someplace else. John Edgerton's been here for a long time. Uh, Adam uh, has come more recently. Adam Ross, um, the author of uh, Mr. Peanut, uh, as you know, uh, it was Judge the best book, one of the best books of the year it was published. Um, he's here to talk today more about Ladies and Gentlemen, um, and that's a collection of short stories, and if you haven't read it, it's terrific reading. Um, but Adam came from New York, um, and uh, he writes and teaches and, and lectures, and uh, um, I know, because we've talked about it, that he loves Nashville. I think he recognizes Nashville as a very special place in terms of letters and people who uh, write. Uh, as we see here today, we have a community of, of writers, um, some who are published and some who are trying to be published, and uh, all of whom, I have no doubt, will be published. Um, as I said, you will have your opportunity to talk to Adam and, and to John Edgerton. Uh, John Edgerton um, uh, came from Atlanta originally, um, stopped in, in Kentucky with his family on the way to Nashville. Uh, as most of you know, uh, he wrote uh, really the uh, bicentennial uh, celebration book of this city, which was a um, stunning document. I still rely on it every time I want to know something about the history of Nashville that I've forgotten. Edgerton's there ahead of me. Um, uh, he, he's here to talk about uh, Alley W. and the Forty Thieves. Uh, and there is a little, um, there's a little message hidden in that, in that title. And those of you who've read his book know what the message is. And if you don't, you're going to find out very shortly. His, uh, uh, his Speak Not Against the Day uh, was a nationally acclaimed uh, award winner. Um, so you've got two authors today, both of whom, um, I mean, publishers look for them. Uh, they know they've got the talent. Uh, and they're here um, to talk to each other uh, Will directing the conversation uh, about their work. Uh, we're all interested in writing. It's uh, said a couple of nights ago that uh, writing is hellish torture. That's not my line, that's Dostoevsky's line. It's what he said about it. And after I said that, I sat down with an author who said, You know, I don't agree with that. He said, The only thing better in writing for me is sex. And, you know, I wasn't going to argue with him about that. Um, <laughs> different strokes for different folks, you know. Um, so I want to thank you all for coming. I'd like to invite you to come every time. Uh, I think it really enriches the life of the city when people who love um, literature, who love writing, who love to write, and who love to meet with people who write, um, come back here at the library. Uh, Elaine Wood has made us so welcome here. Uh, there's always a little buffet. Thank you so much, Elaine. Uh, always a little buffet to start the 
start the program off. And uh, if you haven't been, it's too late now, uh, unless you want to interrupt the authors. And without further ado, my, my colleague, Will Akers, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for coming. Sign the, there's an email list going around. If you haven't signed it already, please get on it so we can tell you about the next one and the next one and the next one. Um, this is an, I've, uh, I've said this before, this is a unique opportunity, I think, because each writer has read the other guy's book. And that makes it more interesting for everybody involved. And uh, first I want to hear from John about Adam's book. What did, what did you tell us about, ladies and gentlemen? Well, no pressure. No pressure, right. I, I am, a, first of all, I gotta plead some defense here. I am a supernumerary on this occasion. There, there was another person who was scheduled to be here who could, could not make it. And uh, Sigenthaler, not for the first time in our association, <laughs> called me up and said, uh, I need a favor. And I said, uh, okay, first tell me the favor, and then I'll tell you what it's going to cost you. <laughs> <laughs> he told me the favor, and I said, great, I'd like to do this. It sounds fun. I was at the last one of these and heard uh, uh, the two gentlemen who spoke about uh, uh, Rodney Crowell and, and uh, Jack Hurst talking about their books. Fascinating conversation. And... Uh, I would not read Adam's first book, nor had I read The Ladies and Gentlemen, but in a matter of uh, 48 hours, I have read a lot of it. Not every story yet, but uh, I think four out of seven. And since uh, the title story is the last story, uh, I think I'll start by talking about that story. You guys hear me? I keep hearing my echo. Okay. Uh, I underlined uh, a couple of, of uh, things in this story, which uh, I'll get to in a minute. But first, I want to set the scene. There's a lady in a hotel. I think it's the Renaissance. Could be some one of the other mm -hmm. hotels. It's clear, though, this is a Nashville-based story in the sense that it starts here, but it ends somewhere else. And this, uh, this young woman, a freelance writer, is here to interview uh, uh, Reese Witherspoon, who is in a movie that, uh, uh, and she lives here, as we know, or did. He's, she's here to interview Reese Witherspoon, and she meets, uh, by chance, a guy she knew in college, not well, but uh, uh, what's, what's the right polite term? Uh, intimately. Uh, and she has not seen him, though she's thought about him uh, again. She's not seen him again, and she happens to meet him because he's involved in this movie. And uh, they make a plan to meet later in the evening. He has to work late if the, everything's intense on a film set. Uh, last minute, she gets an, uh, a text message from him. It's a very modern story. <laughs> ah. I have to interrupt just for a second. You'll appreciate this. My phone is vibrating. <clears throat> <laughs> that's, a, that, that's a sign. Yesterday... My phone went off. I was in one of these rooms, and it was zipped up in my coat pocket. And it took me, uh, by my watch, seven minutes <laughs> <laughs> to get out of the room. I won't go and tell that story. John appreciated that, what happened. But let's get back to Sarah. She's, she's waiting for this guy to come for a rendezvous at her hotel room. And he sends her a text message that says, I can't make it. Fly to Los Angeles tomorrow and meet me. And 
They're both married. They're both married. I, I, I forgot to say, they're both married. The, uh, Small detail. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, so here she is, and she writes him right back and says, okay. Now, the story begins the next morning when the, the alarm goes off, and she's got to jump out of bed and make it out to the airport uh, and, and fly, get, take this flight to Los Angeles. Only problem I found with this story was the timeline that she's getting from her hotel room to the airport, Adam. You need to fix that. Other than that, this, is a, this story is full of twists and turns. She gets on the airplane, and it's a Southwest flight stopping in St. Louis, and she has to go to the back of the plane to find a seat, and the only seat is a middle seat. And the guy sitting over next to the window is uh, a tall, lanky guy. And in the aisle seat is a young woman. The lanky guy gets up and says to her, you may have the window seat, and I'll sit in the middle. And so this story then continues through the air bound for St. Louis, where this guy's getting off the plane, and she's going on to LA, and a conversation begins between these two people, and he too has a, a, a significant role in the production of this movie. <laughs> uh, and so they're talking back and forth, not about the other guy, I don't think his name even comes into it, mm. but this guy is telling her a story now, I'm going to read the rest of it. I want to see if you guys agree with me. I, I don't know what, where I was when I got to the end of it. Mr. Window offered Sarah his seat. She was headed to L.A. to meet Tom McKnight. She's the freelance writer. They have this, this conversation. Uh, and I'm not going to go into the conversation per se, but, but just what happens next. It's, it's all about relationships and complex relationships. Uh, she, uh, the plane lands in St. Louis. They're still seated. The aisle's full and people are walking out. And this is, this is, uh, this is the end of the convert, near the end of the conversation. She says, one more question. All right. Why did your first marriage end? Peter seemed to have anticipated this, rubbing his upper lip while considering the answer. Actually, Sarah says, I'm sorry, that was inappropriate. He says, don't apologize. The truth is I wouldn't have time to tell you the whole story, even if I was going to L.A. She touched his forearm and he glanced at her fingers resting there. He shook his head, shrugged, crossed his arms, leaned toward her. I had an affair, he said, lowering his voice. And then he begins to reveal at the last minute here all of this very intimate stuff about what happened to him. And then he ends up saying to her, well, good luck. And he doesn't even know why she's going to L.A. Uh, then the guy from L.A. sends her a text saying, where are you? No, her husband sends her a text saying, where are you? She's already written him and said, my plane was delayed. I'm going to be late. I'll call you this afternoon. It's just backing up on her everywhere she turns. Complications ensue, she thought, though the blowback from her husband's question was fiercer than she'd anticipated. Where was she headed? What if this meeting with Tom became instead of a permanent comfort, its opposite, an affliction, a widening fissure that sowed cynicism, supplying half-truths and answers to the most innocent questions before they were even asked. Uh, and then, with uncanny synchronicity, a call came from Tom, and on her, Tom's the guy in L.A. waiting for her plane, on the phone, it says, unknown number, answer or ignore. She punches ignore. She could get off here in St. Louis, catch a flight to LaGuardia, 
be home. She could forgive herself for Tom, for the kiss, for all of it, no harm, no foul. Yet it was the possible regrets that troubled her most, no matter which choice she made. The ones that would come to her later in the night and nod at her even now, starting with what you didn't take versus what you did. Not to mention the stories that she might tell a future stranger about this moment and what she had decided before she was airborne again. And this, this is what I wrote at the bottom. Airborne flying west, question. Airborne flying east, what did she decide? And the, 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 the beautiful touch of this story is you think you understand who this young woman is right at the first, after you've met her a little while, and then you realize you don't know who she is at all. And you think you know who this guy in California is, but you don't know enough about him. And what about the guy on the plane? You think you know that, but then you don't know that. And then you come to her again. Here she is. She's had these decisions to make. So far, uh, not the best decisions, or, or so my mind says. And then she makes a decision, and you're at, you don't even tell us what decision she made. And that was, I think, intentional. And it makes for a dang good story. I mean, if you like to read drama that goes down to the last page, that does it. It's not the best ending in the book. There's, a, there's another one in here uh, called Suicide Room. <laughs> Uh, and you don't know really until you get to the very end even wh what happens in this story. You think you know, you think you figured out, and I don't want to spoil this one for you, you need to read this one. You think you know, but you don't know. And then when you find out, uh, you're shocked. And it, this guy manipulates language really well. He, he does this really in a in a fantastic way, he delivers these uh, uh, cruel hoaxes that fall on people that you think, this, guy's, this poor guy's been ripped off. He's been totally deluded only to get home and find out that somebody else had ripped him off even worse. And you're sitting there holding a double load of, but you read all the way to the end, and you keep looking and thinking, what did I miss? And he handles the language so well that I'll just end by saying, aside from getting the time frame right between here and the airport, <laughs> this is a dang good book. I've got a question about the last part of that, this selection, Adam, is that the last sentence is we finally, it all comes to that. We don't know, we don't know, we don't know. We get to the very end. Did you, what did you know when you started that story? What did you know you were gonna do? What, was, what were you aware of when you started? Um, <clears throat> there, there's a great classic story that um, I used to teach the seventh and eighth grade girls at Harpeth Hall, which uh, as some of you may have read, called The Lady and the Tiger. Do y'all know it? Um, where, you know, essentially, uh, without bogging you down with summary, essentially a princess. Um, there's a, there's a, it, a king imposes on a land a form of justice, a form of just basically random justice in this land, whereby, um, you know, there are there are, th you know, two doors and, uh, you know, whatever whatever sort of question of justice needs to be decided, uh, you know. A person, is, a person is required to pick one of the two doors and there's a tiger behind one door 
and a, and a, a princess or a prince behind the other, and, uh, and, and, and the lover of the, of the prince or princess sort of waiting in the Colosseum, and whichever one is picked, either a tiger comes out and rips up the, uh, the beloved or betrothed, or uh, the two are happily married. And the society in this kind of crazy form of early reality television lives vicariously through either this horrific bloodletting uh, or this happy marriage. And um, with, 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 the, with the primary story that it focuses on, you find out that although this, this princess who is uh, going to make this choice, uh, uh, the princess who's going to make this choice about this prince is madly in love with this prince who is waiting in the Colosseum for the, for the lady to come out or the tiger. And to make a long story short, the, the writer sets it up so that it's clear that the princess who's going to give the thumbs up or, th or I'm just going to pick the doors um, is madly, in, is madly enough in love with this man that her jealousy at the, at the possibility of him marrying someone else is completely in balance with, uh, uh, with her desire to uh, see him saved. Um, well, as it happens, with complications ensuing, she somehow, through a spy, gets the information as to which door the tiger is behind. Right. I didn't remember any of this. So the question becomes, the que it's a question of the human heart. It's like, if you were madly in love with somebody and you knew that they would go off and be happy with someone else and you had the, the, the guiltless choice of uh, letting them go and allowing them to be happy or without guilt whatsoever, having a tiger rip them to shreds, what would you do? And so the, 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 the story ends in the interrogative mood uh, to uh, make an allusion to the uh, esteemed Paget Powell to uh, where, where the reader is asked, you know, so which one would you choose? You know? and, and, and of course, you know, if you ask 13-year-old girls which one would they choose, you know, uh, let the boy go off with other girl or rip him to shreds, it's a very interesting question to ask 13-year-old girls. But anyway, so... Um, Many send them to his death, but um, <laughs> um, the real setup of this story happens in the beginning. Is it okay if I read? You sure. Part of that? Because this story, um, which John outlined so well, it's 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 summary. It all boils down, really, to this opening move. And, 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 and for, for aspiring writers in the room, um, I'll, I'll be digressive and I'll tell you two things. I had, I, I had an extraordinary writing teacher, Stanley Elkin. Um, and Stanley Elkin said two things about narrative. He was, he was a Jew. He said, here's, here's the question every narrative should answer, and that is this. Why is this night different from all other nights? Which I still, to this day, whenever I sit down and write a story, not, not a novel, because a novel is a different beast, but a story. Why is this night different from all other nights? And the other thing Stanley Elkin always said was, in a story, a character either does or does not move off the dime. That is to say, a character begins a story in position A. And the whole process, whether you think of stories in like a classical story arc, from establishing conflict to denouement, or establishing conflict to, to rising action, to climax to denouement, is to fret that character's position. Where do they start? And then do circumstances force them to move off that initial position? Is everyone with me? So the way I always think about stories is 
I work really hard to, to get you, the reader, to recognize where, where that mm -hmm. character is. Not spatially, but existentially. Okay? So, and really this story, it's a long-winded answer, and I'm sorry, but really this story, um, Had, had, it, I really owe in a lot of ways to my wife. My wife is a, is a partner in a law firm. We have two daughters, six and five. And if I have learned anything about me being married to a career woman, it is this, that women in this, in today, in this day and age have it coming and going. If you are a working woman in this day and age, if you are a stay-at-home mom, you are failing. You are always failing. Because if you're a working mom, you're neglecting your home. You're neglecting your husband. If you're a single mom, and there's a special place in heaven for them. But if you're a single mom, uh, no matter what you do, you're coming up short. You don't have enough time for work. You have to leave work early to get to the kids. The kids are pissed because you don't have enough time for them. And then you certainly don't have enough time for yourself, which informs all the other things at which you're failing. And not to inject politics into this, but if we look at the Am Romney uh, mention in her speech about, you know, not in her speech, but about how stay-at-home moms work, right, and the brouhaha that that caused, it to, it to me is more evidence, no matter what side of the political spectrum you're on, that women get it coming and going. Because if a woman who dedicated her whole life to staying home with her kids is excoriated by women who are out working saying, you don't know what work is, right? So, she's, she's just been propositioned by this guy, Tom. And, and she's looking in the mirror in the Ruth's Chris Steakhouse restaurant. Oh, yeah. She would follow this man right now anywhere, no questions asked, though her reasons, she promptly listed them, were more complicated and manifold than her desire. She was 39, though she occasionally felt 50. She'd chosen a profession that condemned her permanently to homework and consequently was never not working. She looked forward to traveling alone because on the road she could bathe in peace without the sound effects of her family. Away from them, finally, she felt bereft. Meanwhile, private school ran $36,000 a year times two. Yesterday, she was breastfeeding Rob, and now he was six. Tanner, her first great love since her husband, that's her other child, used to live for the sight of her, but these days cared mostly about his father and Rafael Nadal. She wanted another child, if only to have a baby to hold again, to which suggestion her husband Dale, Dale replied, I'd like to retire with dignity. <laughs> this was reasonable, of course, yet she was heartbroken. She thought the planet was self-emulating. She missed her husband desperately, in spite of the fact that he was right there or possibly because of it. She'd occasionally glimpsed his naked body and realized she felt nothing. She'd catch him staring at hers in the mirror, suspecting that he felt the same thing. She couldn't remember what she did the day before, though each went something as follows. Get the boys ready for school. Clean up the study enough to concentrate. Conduct multiple phone interviews. Do notebook dumps and transcription. Return or delete emails. Eat her meals standing up. Have no exercise whatsoever. Attend editorial meetings uptown, midtown, or downtown. Arrive home to prepare Dale's dinner and not spit at him. When he pours himself a drink, turns on the television, and promises to do the dishes so she can be with the kids, i.e. help them with their homework, put the boys to bed, wash her face and brush her teeth, burn with rage that she hasn't had a single moment to herself in eons, understand as she did now in this bathroom, that she had a year, perhaps two, in which she might still consider herself young. Take something for yourself, she thought, while you still can. Um, so, 
I wanted to, I wanted to put Sarah in the position whereby she thought that this reunion with this man from her youth might be a permanent existential comfort. Something that if she had, if she took, in a life where it feels as if she can't take it all, she's not allowed to take it all, if she could have that thing, it would burn like an enduring coal in her soul, right? And that's hopefully where you punch through from the particular to the universal, that, that, that everyone has felt that. Because quite frankly, the infidelity aspect of it is secondary, if not tertiary. Because all of us, Shangri-La something, right? <laughs> There's everybody, you know, there, I, I know plenty of men who are like, I just, I can never play golf anymore, man. I can't play any golf. If I could play golf, it would be better. You know, it just would. Um, whatever. Can't I just watch the end of this game? You know, I mean, like, please, can you shut up? You know, so everyone does something. And so, and so the question becomes, you know, if, if, if the reader identifies with that, then what, then what the reader has to answer the question. So I wanted, in, in, in sort of the moral concerns of ladies and gentlemen, what does it mean to be a lady? What does it mean to be a gentleman? Uh, I wanted the reader to be in that la lady in the tiger position and answer the question for him or herself. Cool. It worked. <laughs> By the book. Now, can you comment on your page there from Ali W.? Yeah, and let me, so let me, um, I'm going to read you the page that just, so we're all on the same page. They've got page. it. Um, but I'll read it aloud anyway. Um, but before I read it, I want to talk a little about um, satire in general and then another concept because um, you know, completely showing my own hand, you know, when I initially started reading John's book, I was like, oh, you know, I don't want to read about Bush. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's where we're, we're days away from the election. It's like, oh, Lord, like, I just don't want to go there. <laughs> and, but that. what was amazing in reading it was um, how just utterly it depressed me which is a compliment. I'll tell you why. Because um, what John does in Ali W in under 130 pages is, is distill, is, is, is um, by way of satire, bend the Bush administration's, you know, put it in another on a different place in the space-time continuum. But in a really smart move, basically uses the whole lexicon, the, the whole political vocabulary of the Bush administration. We go through the whole, you know, from shock and awe to, to, to dead or alive, um, uh, uh, and, in, and in some ways actually beyond that to... Uh, you know, voodoo economics, trickle-down economics, um, supply-side economics, and, 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 and puts that in, in this fantastical story about, you know, this, uh, this, 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 this war chief. So that the net effect of the satire is to make it seem fantastical. <laughs> to make it seem fantastical that this actually happened, right? Now, I will tell you, I, I did not, at, at, again, in the initial, in the, at, the, at, at the start, I didn't think it would work. But, 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 but this, is, this, is, this is the, some of the opening moves of, of satire when it works. Um, I, I'm sure everyone in this room has read um, what is really, to me, an, 
I don't know if you'll agree with this, but I think one of like the, the, the seminal satire uh, in world literature, and that's Gulliver's Travels, right? Um, which, of course, has you know, Gulliver going to this, through this, this pair of islands, really, the, the Brobdingnags and the Lilliputians. And both the Brobdingnags and the Lilliputians really, you know, the Brobdingnags are the giants, and the Lilliputians are the little people, right? Uh, but Swift, being a, 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 a really a, a genius uh, misanthrope, which is to say a genius hater of humanity, <laughs> There's this incredible description where Gulliver is picked up by one of the Brobdingnags. And the Brobdingnag's face is like the size of this room. And, and point for point, he goes through this description of like the, 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 the dirty pores of the face of this Brobdingnag and the, 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 the nose hairs coming out and the, the spinach between the teeth. And, and, and the dirt on the face and the lice in the head. And you, you come away from it just being absolutely disgusted and aware of our animal nature. The fact that we're, you know, we shower occasionally, but we are as, as host to any and all parasites and forms of dirt as there are. And, uh, and you have a greater appreciation for the fact that we're, you know, Apart from our spine, you know, apart from our cerebral cortex, we're not that far from from uh, beasts of the southern wild. But anyway, so um, so what John does is uh, marry to the story Bush terminology, B Bush administration terminology. So. The decision to invade Afghanistan had been accepted by the vast majority of Americans as a proper and necessary response to Osama bin Hidden or bin Hayden and the 9-11 terrorists. Then, a year or so later, a smaller percentage, but still a majority, accepted Fratbush's argument that the same approach also had to be taken toward the Iraqi dictator Saddam Gomorrah. He was poised to launch nuclear missiles at America, W declared, so we must strike them over there first before they have a chance to strike again over here, we can't afford to wait. The next smoking gun may be a mushroom cloud. Okay, I'm gonna continue reading this, but that's, that's a quote. The book constantly uses quotes from the, now, um, that, that's, that, that, am I alone in this room? <laughs> that, that looking back, not so long ago, and hearing that, as Ben Fountain reads from his National Book Award nominated Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk about the senselessness of Iraq and the carnage thereof, is that not amazing to you that that's, that was said and that people shuddered? Is it not amazing to you? Again, no matter what side of the political spectrum you're on, but we're talking satire, so it's, it's, it's politically charged writing, that in the VP debate, the question put to the candidates were, what are you more afraid of, a nuclear weapon in Iran or another war in the Middle East? And the answer was, a nuclear weapon in Iran. Here we go again. They all need this book. OK. Now, so. Saddam, he declared emphatically, was closely allied with the bin Hayden terrorists who called themselves Al-Qaeda, the base. And in the post-9-11 world, this second Bush king insisted America must separate all nations into... America must separate all nations into two camps, sheep and goats. Either you are with us, the ruler declared, or you are with the terrorists. Now again... And, and, and uh, you know, at a time where, like, I'm up to here myself, as we all are, elections are too long, it is still amazing that any sort of gray area response to war at the time was, 
Is it that simple? <clears throat> Which again, satire frets. Satire, if it's, fun if it's functions, frets the idea that um, things are pure. Um, what's also just, you know, I, ca I can't speak to how John did this because I don't, I don't think I could do it. But um, the great Italian writer who you should all read, Italo Calvino, that's I-T-A-L-O, Calvino, C-A-L-V-I-N-O, um, had a concept he wrote about called lightness, which is the capacity of fable to subtract weight from narrative, which is to basically reduce narrative down to its essentials, which is a strategy that whether consciously or unconsciously, Mr. Edgerton employs, whereby um, he takes he takes terminology that is normally bogged down in history and attaches it to this like simple and outlandish story in such a way that the insanity of that administration's language shines forth. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's comical and it, and it gives you a chuckle and it's scary at the same time. And there's three copies in the National Library System. Two are here. So. Um, They'll be back in the system tonight. It's always, it's, always, it's always a good thing. It's always bracing to read satire because um, uh, it reminds you, you know, whether it sets things on fictional islands or it bends the space-time continuum, it reminds you that no matter where some of these things happen, um, we, are, we are an unfortunate, a, a, a tragically cyclical species. <laughs> we forget, we repeat, we go round and round. Um, our, our hungers trump our discipline, you know. Uh, so, but only satire wakes you up to that, and that's what makes it art. So that's what I'll say about that. Thank you. So I've got a question for you. You, uh, and this is all in your handout, is um, John had some ideas of things to do for writers to keep in mind when they're writing. And there were two that I wanted to ask you about. One, it says, write to learn, not to show what you know unless you're a professor. And then the other one is, style and substance are to writing as a balance pole is to tightrope walking. Could you tell us what, what those mean? Well, uh, first, first, if I may, uh, let me confess that I didn't think up Ali W. and the 40 Thieves just in the afternoon of brilliance oh. that came through the sky. I found Ali W. and 40 Thieves in an old bookshop called The Haunted Bookshop, believe it or not, in Mobile, Alabama on a rainy afternoon in about 1990, before, before George Bush. And uh, it was a book called uh, The Last American. And it was written by a man named John A. Mitchell. It was published in New York in 1885. And uh, I was fascinated by it. I knew I was going to buy it as soon as I saw it. it had wonderful uh, uh, pen and ink uh, sketches in it. And it essentially took a story set in the next millennium, the late 20 hundreds, 20,000s, 2787 or something like that, where a group of uh, men boarded a ship in Persia and sailed across the Atlantic West into the 20th century, actually the 19th century, and came to New York and found a wasteland uh, uh, buildings 
that were half fallen in. Bridges, the Brooklyn Bridge collapsed. No people. And they wander the streets until they see one guy in a sort of a breech cloud with a stick. And they decide that he's dangerous, so they kill him. Now, I've got some of the details of this a little out of skew. It may be when they sailed from New York down to Chesapeake Bay and into the harbor and went to Washington. That was where they found the guy. But here's, here's the point I want to make as quickly as I can. John A. Mitchell, who incidentally uh, published the first Life magazine, and sold the title Life Magazine to, uh, what's his name, John, who was the, the loose guy, had a magazine of political satire and cartoons in the 1885s, and he was incensed by the Gilded Age and the robber barons, and he was inspired to write that story, The Last American, by what he saw going on in the world and what he was basically saying was, you fools, if you keep doing this, this whole thing's going to come down around your ears. So I find his book, and, and, and a, a book, I once, I once wrote about a book called, uh, I put on this list, W.J. Cash is the Mind of the South. I came onto that book in a hospital bed one time and I described it in a later book as, as if someone had rolled a hand grenade under my bed. That's how affected I was by that book. And what happened to John A. Mitchell that made him so mad happened to me 10 years, 6 years. What's the date on that book? Is it 06, I think? I think I wrote it in 06. <laughs> M-M-V-I. 06. <laughs> <laughs> I did use a couple of clever ideas. I was so incensed by what was going on, I had, uh, I had no, I, I was like so many people, not just liberal Democrats, but people all over the world feeling the earth moving beneath our feet, that, that things were so out of control and I found that book long before this all happened, but in 2006, that book was still lying on my shelf. And one day I picked it up, and suddenly I saw that John A. Mitchell was about to be plagiarized. <laughs> Not in his words, but in my own. I, I wasn't going to his place. I was going to say... Okay, so these guys went back to Persia in 2719. But then the next generation, the, 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 the couple of them's children and grandchildren thought, let's go back and look again. Maybe they made that story up about New York. Let's go back and look again. And so I get my boat and we go and we look. And I knew where I was going with that story. It had already been written in the format by John Mitchell and had been written in the narrative by George Bush. And all I had to do was put them together. And so uh, I can't claim credit for the story, but it is the most fun thing I ever did. I wrote it in about three months. And uh, just to show you how apocalypse works, the book was supposed to come out in July before the 2006 midterm elections. It came out on October the 27th. Nobody ever saw it. It was never reviewed anywhere. Uh, it's the only book I ever wrote that did not get one single review in any medium, except I was on... Uh, uh, the satellite radio with Bob Edwards, my old buddy Bob Edwards, took pity on me and said, come on up here, I'll talk to you. And I went on the radio with Bob Edwards. That was the only publicity I got. As far as I know, I was, I was so distraught at, at, at that point, I just said, 
there was a message in here, and I, I think I've gotten the message. And I just walked away from it. And the reason I wanted Adam to have this book for this occasion was not because I wanted to say, here's a great piece of satire. It was, I either give him a 120, 140 page book, or I give him Speak Now Against the Day is 700 pages. <laughs> and I, I, I took pity on him, and I <laughs> gave him the little book. But I'm still proud of that little book. <laughs> In its own way, it, it, it does have that feeling that satire which in this case I call political science fiction, is, uh, is a very useful tool. And I still sort of carry around in my head the possibility that I may continue this into a series called the Western Voyages, where these Persians keep coming back, and uh, we find that, uh, that not just America, but the whole world is just about to go over that cliff and fall into the sea. Oh, John, I hope you don't have to write that. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. So tell, tell me about style and substance, and why is that important to you in your writing, and why should it be important in there? Why is what important? Style and substance. Well, uh, what else is there? Style. If you, if you don't find a voice that speaks to people, if you don't, uh, if your writing doesn't read well aloud, if you, uh, if you walk around thinking you've got brilliant ideas but you can't get them across to people because your language is turgid and, and, uh, and uh, full of all kinds of, of uh, 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 arteriosclerosis, <laughs> uh, then you don't have anything. And then once you have style, you've got to have something to say. I mean, you, even, if you, even if it's just what you make up. And I think people who make up stuff have a lot easier time than people who have to stick to the facts or want to stick to the facts or try to stick to the facts. But even if it's a, just a little dalliance, if it's just a little whimsy of something, if it ain't got no style, and it doesn't say anything except that you are good at turning a phrase, and you don't have anything. So style and substance to me are like the opposite ends of that balance pole that, that a, a writer walks on a tightrope with. About to fall one way or the other, if you get too enamored with your own verbiage, you know, I remember one time I wrote a, about a guy who lived in a, in an old plantation house in South Carolina. It was just, it was a wooden house and it, it showed it was from the pre-Civil War days and this old guy lived in there. He was a fabulous guy and my story about him was a wonderful story, but at the end of the story, I said going back through the avenue of the oaks out to the, uh, to the rest of the world, I looked back in the rear view mirror at his house and it looked like it looked like Tara after Sherman. And I just loved that phrase. I just thought that was so something cute about it that I really thought I could get away with. And uh, months later, the book came out, and this gentleman I had written about was lavish in his praise of me. He just went out of his way to tell me how I had captured what his life was like inside that house and everything. He said, uh, uh, but Mr. Edgerton, that phrase, Tara after Sherman, that was not only inaccurate, that, that incensed my wife, and it hurt my feelings. And I thought, well, what a fool I was to cling to a, a phrase, you know, whatever. Any phrase you think of. Adam's book is full of beautiful phrases. So beautiful, so apt that you think, if it won't work here, save it and use it somewhere else. It's too good to just let it go away. And he uses them effortlessly in, in his stories. They work almost every time. But if you don't have those two things, I don't know, I don't know what, what else we're doing when we try to communicate on, I started to say on the page. We don't get to do that. Any, don't get me started on pages. <laughs> okay. Okay. 
I won't. I'm done. But later. Adam, tell us about the importance of surprise in storytelling. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, you know, again, I'll talk about this in terms, in terms of story structure. Uh, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big Hitchcock fan. Um, <clears throat> and uh, without giving like a full-scale lecture on Hitchcock, Hitchcock, Hitchcock's sort of classic storytelling telling method was what he called the MacGuffin. And every movie, every Hitchcock movie has what's called a MacGuffin. And that is the thing that at the, outset of the, at the outset of the story seems like it's the most important thing, right? So, in Rear Window, did that guy across the courtyard from Jimmy Stewart, Lars Thorwald, did he kill his wife? That's the MacGuffin. Because as the narrative proceeds, whether or not Lars Thorwald killed his wife, is far less important than whether Jimmy Stewart and Grace Kelly are going to get it on, <laughs> which for this man is very important. <laughs> um, but take any Hitchcock movie, you know, take, uh, you know, Shadow of a Doubt, you know, is, uh, is Uncle Charlie the Merry Widow murderer and are they going to bring him to justice? But it's really a question of whether or not young Charlie is played by the, the, the lovely Teresa Wright is going to um, let her uncle go scot-free and uh, or 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 bring him down. The MacGuffin, the MacGuffin sets up uh, uh, in such a way that the reader is pulled along very powerfully. And, and, and ha it, 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 surprise, surprise always has an antecedent, is what I'm saying. Like, there, there, you, you know, surprise doesn't happen out of nowhere. A surprise is based on reader expectation, right? And, um, and you know, as a, as a fan of Hitchcock, I, you know, and, you know, I think that it's, 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 it's one of the strengths I rely on in my work is what, just hooking the reader. I mean, like, you know, powerfully grabbing the reader at the beginning of a narrative to in some ways buy myself time to explore what the narrative is really about, right? Um, uh, the first story in my book is called Futures. In some ways, it's the story I'm most proud of in the, in the, in the collection. But it's about a guy who is, is desperate for a job, who's been unemployed for a long time, and walks into the strangest job interview he's ever had in his life. It is so bizarre. He gets, he gets asked questions about, you know, does he believe in psychics? You know, does he believe in uh, you know, telekinesis, Nostradamus? Uh, you know, uh, does he believe in uh, Egyptian symbology? And the woman won't tell him uh, what the job is, but whatever he says, she thinks, you know, he's really qualified. Could he, she, could he come back for another interview? And he says, yes. You begin that story, and all your interest, you're like, what's the job? What the heck could this guy be questioned about when it comes to like, things like Nostradamus and stuff that he would want this job? But the story isn't about that at all. So surprise, what surprise does is, surprise is in some ways, the, uh, it's like fireworks, you know what I mean? It's like the, it's like the pretty little payoff for something that, that is really all about anticipation. Because the pleasure, when we go see, like, we, here's another analogy. When we go see a fireworks show, right, what are we really waiting for? We're waiting for the final rally, you know, the, you know, but, the final fusillade, right? To use a fancy John Edgerton word. But, but the final fusillade's pleasure only comes from the, you know, the initial just You know, thanks. Thanks, my kids love when I do that. But anyway, so, um, 
And then, you know, then you get the big pow. But, but it's, it's your pleasure along the way as things build that makes for that. Cool. I'm going to ask you both the same kind of question, although it's different because mostly you write nonfiction and you're fiction. But I want to ask about character. Is what's the importance, because you're talking about you've got to stick with the facts. But when you're creating a work of nonfiction, you're still creating this character, whoever the thing is about. And so how do you think about character in nonfiction, and how do you pick who you're going to write about? Well, uh, I guess the best example I can think of is uh, I wrote a book called Speak Now Against the Day which is about the generation before the civil rights movement. So it's roughly from Roosevelt's election in 32 to uh, the Brown decision, 22 years. And uh, uh, I came late to writing that book because uh, I think in a way it was a book I, I had wanted to write for a long time and had, and in fact, had done a lot of interviews uh, uh, with a lot of people who were prominent in that period of time, some of whom had since died, uh, but I still had their stories, and I saw a story that really uh, went something like this. I saw, I saw, I saw the storyline that, uh, that the South coming out of the Civil War had uh, made a, 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 a faithful choice through its elected representatives and its power holders to go in a certain direction. And that direction was uh, away from where the war had pointed it, away from where the Emancipation Proclamation had pointed it, it was, it was to a, a direction that had been in place since the beginning, that black people uh, were not really human. They, had not, they, they did not have the qualities of humanity that made uh, Christian white people say, we're all in this together. You have to construct something that you can get a lot of people to believe that flies in the face of, of uh, what you like to think ought to be the answer. And so that faithful choice coming out of the Civil War and going into uh, the uh, end of Reconstruction and into the period of segregation, which got formalized into national law in the 1890s and carried all the way through until, until Brown. A hundred, I mean, uh, you know, 75 years after the war. And I knew enough by the time I started to create that storyline I knew, I, knew enough, I knew enough about a few things to know what that storyline had to contain. It had to be about black people who had borne the brunt of, of the inhumane treatment that came with slavery and was carried on in all these other forms. <clears throat> and it had to be about the relative handful of white people who knew that was wrong. And how did they deal with it? And especially the ones who lived in the South. The people who lived in the North could afford not to give it a whole lot of thought because three-fourths of African-American people lived in the South. And every state in the South had a minimum of 25, 30% African-American population. And after all the years of mistreatment, of, of uh, uh, genocide committed against African American people, uh, that white population, driven by fear 
of consequences as much as anything else, said to itself collectively, we were, we're not going to get off this line. We're going to fight for this. This was our lost cause, and we are not going to surrender it. We, we're going to go to the end with this. And I knew through personal experience and through research and through travel that there were people in the South, white people in the South, who didn't feel that way, and my question was, why did they not feel that way, and what did they do about it? And so I dis determined that I wanted to write that history of that 22-year period in such a way that those two groups of people uh, somehow came to face each other and see this. And I made a number of false starts trying to write that book. I couldn't find a voice for it. I couldn't find, there was nobody who could tell the story because it was too broad and it covered too long a period of time and I wanted it to sound like a conversation. I wanted it to sound like something your grandfather could tell you on the porch. And uh, I couldn't do it. So. One day, I was, uh, I got on a little riff with, with, with first person pronouns. I got, I got on a little riff that started with uh, the fact that I was born in Crawford W. Long Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia on June the 14th, 1935, and that at that time there were, there were still mule-drawn wagons going through the streets of Atlanta and these things were happening, and, and I could see that, and I could describe that without using those pronouns, but at some point over in the narrative, you have to give your readers a clue. Who's telling you this? Where is this coming from? So I invented this little device in which, uh, instead of saying in 1935, Atlanta was thus and so, I said, I was born there on that day. And of course, I didn't know these things were happening, but my mother knew, my father knew, these other people knew, and Ralph McGill knew. And I began to feed these people into the story, people I'd met, white people, black people, from different states. And, and uh, something like 1,200 people later, 800 pages later, seven years later, I came to a place where I said to my editor, uh, I'm, th I'm through, but I'm not satisfied. And she said, take another year. And I said, I would commit suicide if I took another year. I've got to get out of here. I've got to get, walk out of here somehow on my own two feet. And if I had taken another year and taken another 100 pages out of that book, it would have been a better book. But uh, it was the hardest thing I ever did by far. Uh, so hard that uh, I don't even dream of doing anything like that again. I'm too old. You know what I'm saying? We're sort of a sim similar generation. Uh, so uh, I had to find somebody to tell the story. And it, and it ended up having to be me. So at each step along the way, and there's four big divisions in that book, one that's in the 30s, roughly, a couple in the 40s, and one in the 50s, roughly speaking. And at each beginning of each section, there's this little, uh, this little first person thing that walks through there for a little while, maybe just a couple of pages, just enough to kind of get a little, uh, firmness under my feet and let these other people begin to take it from there. And I, you know, I more or less got away with it. Uh, it uh, I still couldn't think of, a, of another way to do that that would... But you didn't know it at the beginning. I didn't know. You found it as you went along. I found it as I went along. Which is fine. You don't have to know everything. No, you don't. When you, you sit down. You out. absolutely don't. I didn't know. I knew. I was a long way into writing that book before. I knew how I was going to start it. Uh, I pretty much found a character in Ralph McGill that 
uh, gave me uh, a good ending, and I saw I saw that th that was going to happen when I was not not too far along. He was up early in the front. He appears early on the day in 1945 when the war is over and he's standing in the window of his office at the Atlanta Constitution looking out at the, the uh, wild celebration in the streets at uh, Forsyth Avenue in Atlanta. But the main character it, ended up being you. It ended up in a way being me, but I think it tamped down so much that it's a device, really. But it worked. It, I, I, so y'all, it's y'all's turn in one second. I want Adam to answer this last question, so everybody be thinking up a question or two. How do you build a character? The, uh, I'll give the, I'll give the, I'll give a short answer. Character character comes from the Greek meaning to sharpen. The the Greek the Greek root of of the word character means to sharpen, and so to sharpen, to sharpen. So I Focus. mean, whenever whenever you include whenever you include a detail as you're building a character, that character, that detail has to in some way always be in terms of that identity so that you particularly, you keep sharpening like a your, lens. your idea of, of, of who is speaking. So I mean, uh, in, the, in the passage I wrote from Sarah's point of view, you know, uh, you know, I, I choose a character who feels trapped. So I mean, you have to, you have to, um, you have to, in a, in a very believable and concrete way, show how this woman, who is a successful journalist, feels pinched on every side of her life, and feels and feels as if everything that used to give her comfort is gone. And so, step by step, sharpen at every turn. And if you're not doing that. Uh, it, it presents itself to you as you read stuff back or as you watch, you know, your friend's eyes glass over as you read to them. <laughs> That's a scary proposition. Now, who's got a question? Yes, ma'am. A question for Adam. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I seem to remember that Mr. Peanut took some time. Oh, yeah. Right? Yes. I mean, I mean, it, it, it took it took a solid twelve years. Now, now, both it was both books together because I wrote Ladies and Gentlemen during breaks from Mr. Peanut, and I was working full time. I was a journalist at the Nashville Scene, um, and I was a teacher at Harpeth Hall. So, I mean, uh, th that contributed to it, but it was twelve years. So my question is about now that you've been validated. <laughs> in the world. Um, what is the process like for you from a writer's confidence perspective in terms of how it influences um, what it's like to have your butt in a chair and um, write now? Is it more terrifying? Because it's more on the line? Is it, is, it, is it something that the confidence and validation affects? Um, I hate to tell you this, <laughs> but, but uh, it does nothing. Um, I have been, I mean, you're looking at a lottery winner, you know, nobody, nobody working on anything for 12 years in the dark thinks that you know, their first book's gonna end up on the cover of the New York Times Book Review and blah, blah, blah. And you really do think <laughs> when that craziness starts to happen that it's all gonna be smooth sailing. And that, is in, that, that confidence is immediately decimated by the time you spend every day in front of the page. Um, I've been working on a new novel now for a year, five days a week. And I've written about 150 pages, which um, in some ways sound like John's process, whereby, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, it's hard to find, a, you know, I'm not sure about, you know, is this the right approach? Is this the right scope? It has no, and by the way, it has nothing to do with self-consciousness about, like, what's the next thing? Like, 
all those kinds of market force ideas, they actually don't enter my mind at all. The issue becomes just um, the fact that in some ways, uh, here's another Shangri-La moment, you know, sometimes I wish I were back to being nobody, um, working, uh, uh, you know, in these short bursts of time I had, uh, simply because um, it mitigated the pain of having, you know, double sessions a day to work. Um, however, on the good side, um, well, there are two good things. Number one, uh, you have some really great professionals on your side. You have a good agent. I do. I have the best editor in the world, as far as I'm concerned, Gary Fiskejohn, who is a Nashvillian who edits Cormac McCarthy, Richard Ford, Richard Russo, blah, blah, blah. So if I write crapola, he's going to tell me. But, um, but also, um, the point is this to anybody in here who's writing, is that it is, it is, it is no different for the writer who's never published a thing or a writer who has a book in 16 languages, which is that it has to work on the page. If it's not working on the page, then there is no secret, no how to get published manual you can read, no agent you can get, no thing a friend can tell you, or a spouse, or a editor you hire that can help with that problem. It just has to work on the page. And that's, you know, it's one of the great, it's one of the great uh, non-mysteries about writing. You know, it's, it's uh, it, if it doesn't work on the page, it doesn't work. I can answer the same question after 20 screenplays. It's, n it, it has not gotten any easier. And I get paid to write, it feels just like when you don't get paid to write. It's just hard. Who's got another question? Um, thank you for your discussion. My name is Elliot Poet, and um, some writers have used the power of routinization to express their ideas on paper. Uh, for example, Steven Spielberg uh, writes at a certain time, certain plays for the, the same mug. Um, what routine do you have if you have one? Um, or do you have one? And if so, what would that unique routine be for both? John. I don't have a schedule. Uh, I'm working when I wake up in the morning and I stop when I go to sleep at night. And I may not be sitting at my keyboard all that time, but uh, I know I, I, I've got a pretty good BS detector, sort of self, self built in. I, I find out pretty quickly when what I'm trying to do is, is is not working, and uh, I'm fairly merciless about it. I don't, uh, I don't keep. If if I've got a good idea, I can be patient through a lot of bad writing. But you know, I I think maybe I've had four or five really good ideas in my entire career. And not all of them have ended up as books. Uh, but a couple or three of them did, and, it, and the gestation period was a very long period of time. And uh, I, I don't, in terms of when I get it down on the paper or when I know it's working, it's a crapshoot. I, I don't have any idea, you know. I can work all day and, and get a page and feel good about it, I can work all day and get 20 pages and feel good about it too. <laughs> but most of the time if I'm, stuff is rolling out and I'm having fun, it's not going to hold up. I'm, I'm, I'm on a self-delusion trip. That's interesting. I mean, I, I, I mean I'm, I, you know, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm very routinized. I, I, I do a session in the morning that lasts 
three hours or maybe a little more. I take a break and I usually do some exercise and then I do a shorter session afterward. Um, and uh, for me, this is really, I, I, I tend to cut it off after like three or four hours because I start to make, I tend to make bad choices after about that long. I start to over-examine things. And uh, my afternoon endurance for it is a little bit less. And again, I'm just, I'm really always wary of really bad, of, of, of starting to make bad choices. Um, I think it's really important. And uh, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just jump in and say this. Uh, I had a friend uh, who sat me down after the whole Mr. Peanut thing and was like, I really, I've always wanted to be a writer. What's your advice? And I was like, you want to, you want to, I was like, you want to, here's how you figure out if you really want to be a writer. This is all you have to do. For three months, do this. But, 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 but you have to do this. For three months, just set aside an hour and a half, just an hour and a half, if you're busy. But let's make it two if you're really serious. And, and every, five days a week for three months, sit in front of the screen or the page or whatever and write for two hours. And if you can stand the, the stretches of either delusion or self-loathing, <laughs> then, then you probably want to write. Um, but if, if you find that is excruciating, then, then you best leave that alone. Because there's no, there's no prescriptive. It's just, but, you know, when I was a little boy, even when I was three years old, uh, I was the kind of kid, my dad, my dad, who's a Russian Jew, was like, you have, you have zitzfleisch, which is Yiddish for, you have the sitting flesh. Like I could sit on my butt for a long time doing one thing. <laughs> and, uh, and so, I don't know. Just try that. Martin was talking about his creative process, and they asked him about um, when do you write, and uh, you know, uh, and satisfied with your writing. He said, "I never write. I only write when I really want to write, and it, it's always just great." But he, but there are times that a writer needs to spend uh, pursuing the business of writing, and Steve Martin referred to that type of work as done by the monkey mind, and that there are things that you need to do, and it doesn't really tap your heart of creative process. Um, and then the other thing is that for the person who's seeking to complete that connection between the uh, intentional mind and the unconscious or creative mind, I think it really helps to have that schedule and that maybe to go two hours is a lot, but a co-author I worked with who's not a writer um, worked with just simply a, a time to meet your creative mind, 8 o'clock, and if you can only do 15 minutes, fine, uh, but be there. Because if, if you have, uh, you're not a writer, you know, you don't really train or anything, and you, and you haven't been living this life for 20 years, and so there's a communication gap between your conscious and your unconscious, but you're living in a body. And if you let your body tell you which time each day is its time, if you meet your body at, and mind at that time regularly, your mind will begin to kick in at that time after a while and expect you to be there and be a good and faithful servant and render your services because your mind is saying, okay, eight o'clock's my time, eight o'clock's my time, and you're like, no, I have a job and everything. And you're like, dude. And if you don't, you know, your your unconscious mind can really sabotage you. If you try to bring it along and set up a good relationship and set up respect, I'm gonna to listen to you, I'm gonna write what you tell me, you have to do it. It's a habit is a great thing because you begin to get to where you miss not writing. Yeah. And if you set up, if you get in the habit of doing it, then it feels bad not to do it. But it if takes a long time to get there. I find if you, if you can sit there all day, it means you really like doing it. Yes, sir. Um, on the discussion about satire, I wondered, um, the, the, one of the hopes of satire would be not just the people who agree uh, kind of get the joke and see through it and see what it is. But people who would, you come in the back door, people who wouldn't have agreed before but see it in a new light and then say, whoa, I didn't, I couldn't see it for what it was at the time, but presented this way, it's, it's kind of, it makes me think. 
I'm, I'm sure that's one of the, the hopes. Um, so it's easy to write satire for first groups, people who agree with you, because they're all, let's go ahead and make fun of whatever. <coughs> How do you go about um, not crossing the line, or what kind of balancing act do you need to do to be able to entice and uh, people who wouldn't agree with your point of view, but you want to take them along with the story and hope they will show up and stay with you um, through the entire thing? What are those ideas and choices? I would just like to hear about that. Well, political satire, you're in a bind because, uh, you know, right from the get go, whether it's satire or any other form, uh, people bring their own uh, preconceived notions to that argument. But you, you do have that in mind when you're, when you're thinking about it and when, you, when you're writing. And uh, there are some passages in my book in which uh, it's not, and in my life, in my, in my attitude toward politics, it's not just about me not, not liking the Republican point of view. Uh, I'm, I'm as unhappy about a lot of things I see Democrats doing, and stuff that's been repeated now that went on in that time, so that, uh, uh, you know, I, I really don't have a way to know how other people feel about this because so few people read it in the first place that I can't be sure, but uh, I kind of think I could, uh, I could do a reading out of this book let me make the selections to a, a, a mixed group of, uh, of Republicans and Democrats and, uh, and get away with it. Where it's, it's entertaining, it's humorous, it's insightful, it strikes a chord, whether or not uh, makes people comfortable is another thing, but you can often make people laugh about things that, that they're not comfortable thinking about. Yeah, let me ask a question about voice. I mean, um, you raised the question about character. Um, well, I think for both writers of nonfiction, and maybe more particularly for fiction, um, if it's going to ring true, um, you've talked about character, character but the voice almost. Um, has to ring true uh, and um, be true to the image of the character. Um, John writes uh, frequently uh, from a historical perspective, and of course you knew who the person was, you have a real sense of character, but still there's a problem, um, even if the quote is on record, making sure that uh, you know, that, uh, so the word fits the action and the personality. With Adam, uh, my guess is it's much tougher uh, for the fiction writer um, because you know you're creating three, four, five, six, ten, twelve voices. Um, and I mean, in, in, in the case of the lover in Los Angeles and the other on the plane, I mean, these are these are two fellows with the same thing on. Mm -hmm. On mind, mm -hmm. and still, each one of them has an individual uh, voice. I'd just like for you to talk about the that okay. whole, the whole mm -hmm. idea. That, that's, 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 a great, that's a great question. And again, for people, for people in the room who are, who are uh, writing their own material, um, the, 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 the choice you make about voice at the beginning of a narrative sets up every move that follows, full stop. Um, you know, um, if, in, the current, in the current thing I'm working on right now, which is called Play World, the, the, the line that I had had in my mind that started the novel for so long was that was the year that I s discovered my great talent, which was getting adults to talk to me. And then, and it's a really good beginning. 
But then I had another really good beginning, which is <laughs> nothing I'm about to tell you seems strange at the time. <laughs> and that's a really good beginning. Um, and then I had another beginning, which was I thought I fell in love that year, but it was only a rehearsal. And, and, and now, I, I bring these up, A, because it, this is being filmed and I'm mentioning it publicly, so if you steal those beginnings, you're dead. But also because all, all three represent a whole different set of, co of commitments to uh, subject and tone. You know, s s one, is, one, is, one, is, one is strange, one is sad. One is curious, you know, one has more potential for humor than the other. And so, and so you, you, just by that opening gambit with the voice, now this is, this is especially true in first person, you are committing to, a, you know, a certain, a, a certain tonal range. The book, I'm, the book I'm working on right now, one of, one of the struggles with it is, I, you know, I, I want it to have a comic aspect. It's about a child actor. As you were. As I was. And, and child actors see a lot of kooky, funny things. And the situations that they're put in are both funny, hilarious, and uh, also horrible. And so, um, you know, if, if your opening mood is melancholic, then it, it, it allows less room for the comic. Um, so that's just something to, th to, to think about with your, with your first lines, you know, like, is, is there, you know, and, and then you could think of all the great first lines, you know. Yeah. Lolita, light of my life, fire of my loins, my sin, my soul, Lolita, trip of the tongue, taking a trip down the palate, clap the teeth, one, two, three. Yeah, I mean, you know, you can, I mean, like, it's funny, it's playful. Uh, it's also about a, you know, 12 year old girl. So, I mean, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's the most important choice there is. John, what do you say about voice? First lines or? Just voice, Just voice. voice in general. I've already said everything I know to say. I, <laughs> I've told you guys, if I, I can't find a voice, I'm, I'm not going to be able to, to tell a story. And it's either got to be my voice, and most of my work is journalism, and I, I, you know, I have to stand on what my own feelings are and in that, in that uh, restricted arena, you, you, you don't have a lot of latitude, Even, whether you're writing news stuff or whether you're writing opinion. Uh, if you're the guy and the people know who you are and you start telling them stuff that's not believable, uh, you're not going to, you're going to pay for it. But that's why I thought what you were saying was so true about the process he described about writing, you know, that book. Yeah. Because you, 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 whether on like a precognitive level or again like your friend's eyes glassing over you or your eyes glassing over you sort of know and it can be just like an itch and 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 you're just kind of like it's there's something it's not that there's necessarily something wrong you know I, you know I another another addendum sort of answer to your question is I, I the good thing about how much practice I've had is I can gild a lily Okay, I mean, I can, I, can make, I can make things look pretty. It just doesn't necessarily mean I have anything to say. And listening to that, as initial, that initial feeling of like hesitance is part of the process because, you know, some, somewhere in, in, the, in the way in which your unconscious organizes things, you know that you're making a commitment to something like very organic. You, you had a question in the back, but right there, yeah. My question is about the agents. How do you get an agent here in Nashville? Okay, let me just say this. I'll answer this one question about getting an agent. It's the, it's, it, nobody, well, very few people know this secret about getting agents, but it's really, and here it goes. You ready? You have to write a good book. You have to write a good book. 
In fact, if you write a good book, the agents will come to you. My, so my thought on getting an agent, I've had 11. I'm, <laughs> I'm on my 11th, I hope he's my last. And this is the depressing part of getting agents is, I think you have to know someone who really, really thinks you're a great writer who will give your work to an agent. That's the only way I've ever gotten one. And on that depressing note. Yeah. For either one of you, or both of you, um, is there a book or, or a, a body of work that you were so on fire about writing, you knew this was like, this was like the best thing you've ever done, and at some point you tossed it? Absolutely. And, and, and maybe came back to it, or you know, either, either way. I had the best title in the world for a book that I thought I could write. Uh, it's, a, it's about organ, organ transplants and, and uh, the market and organs. And I wanted to call it Spare Parts. And somebody already did it, I know. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, even, even before I found out that somebody uh, already had my title, uh, I, I got to the place where I knew I wasn't going to write that book. And I'd, put a, I'd invested a lot of time in research. I hadn't actually started writing, but one thing about uh, uh, making a living as a freelance, which I did for 40 years, is that uh, you, and you can't do it anymore, I think, uh, quite like it was then because most people don't pay for you to write anymore. You know, do you notice? Did anybody notice that? You don't get paid to write like you used to. I used to, I could do 50 things a year, you know, short, medium, long. And I was in this, just like your character, constant turnover to do stuff. But I was living in Nashville, not in New York and I owned my car. My kids were in public school, and I could get away with it. And I, I made a good living as a freelance writer for most of that time. But uh, you can't get very far doing that if you keep grinding your wheels to turn something into something if there's nothing there. And I, I reached the point where I, did, I just thought, I don't have what it takes to write this particular book. That is, deep, intense interest, knowledge, uh, a good sense of where the facts are. You don't have to know everything, but you have to know where to find what you need to know. And, and, and on all three of those counts, that, that book just wasn't going to work for me, but it took me a long time to figure it out. There's a great scene in, well, there are a series of scenes that really speak to this in um, Alfred Hitchcock's Rear Window. Have you, have you seen it? Um, the, one of Jimmy Stewart's favorite people to watch out his window is the songwriter. And the songwriter, the, the movie begins, and he's fiddling with this tune, right? And at one point, Grace Kelly comes over. She says, this is the most beautiful music I've ever heard. And then another night, um, Jimmy Stewart's alone watching the songwriter and he comes home drunk and he looks at the music and he plays it a few times and he <laughs> knocks it off the piano. It's like, it's terrible. He passes out. And then uh, another, another night he's trying again. And then the movie ends with the song on the radio, which is to say this, I think that rather than being a, there being a hard and fast rule, if you keep coming back to it, you cannot let it go. There is something there. There's something there. If you can let it go, if you can walk away, there's nothing there. And, and as a guy, I, look, again, you know, I wrote the first three chapters of Mr. Peanut in a single sitting, and I sort of knew the end. If you had told me at the outset that it would take me 12 years to finish it, I never would have finished. No. But I kept coming back. And, um, you know, people always tell me about Mr. Peanut. They're like, it was such a quick read. 
I've read that in like two and a half days. It's so depressing. <laughs> you know, it's like, wow, like what's the inverse? Like, would someone do the algebra on that one? But I mean, you know, and, and, and which goes back to another thing John is saying, which, you know, like, or we were talking about earlier at lunch. I mean, like, you know, you come back, you come back, you come back, and, um, well, l l let me leave you this, because um, it actually goes to the agent question, and it goes to writing a good book question. Here's something I always tell myself writing Mr. Peanut, and that is this. Never underestimate the power of a finished thing. Never, un uh, that was like the little cheerleader in my head was like, never underestimate the power of a finished thing. Because your friends can read something, you know, a chapter or two, and they'll be like, it's great, so then what? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. then what happens, you know? <laughs> I, it'll probably be good, but, you know, but if you finish it, then you can figure out where the imbalances are and this and that, and then someone from the outside looking in can be like, I can sell that. But you got to finish it. But you got to finish it. Thank you all very much. Thank you yeah. both. Thank you. Thank you for sitting through it. <laughs>